Well, good afternoon, everyone. Let's um, let's get started. I'd like to make some introductory remarks. Um, welcome to the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policies Grand Rounds. My name is Nevin Cohen, and I'm an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management. And I'm also the director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Uh, the Urban Food Policy Institute works across disciplines and sectors to make the food system just, healthy, and resilient. With our partners who include community organizations, government officials, and research colleagues, we develop strategies and policy relevant evidence to address the root causes of urban food policy, uh, problems. In cities like New York, a central failure of our food system is food insecurity. And the racial and ethnic disparities in malnourishment and diet related diseases that result. Poverty is the main determinant of food insecurity and poverty is in turn a function of wealth disparities, which are the legacy of decades of redlining and other racially biased land use policies, along with low wages and the high cost of living. A huge percentage of working households in New York City, 50% by one estimate, lack sufficient income to meet the minimum everyday costs of living in the city, with Black and Latinx households more likely to face an economic shortfall. Housing is the number one cost driving these inequities, and the close connection between housing, food insecurity, and disparities in diet-related diseases is why the work of Earl Chambers is so critical to those of us concerned about creating a just food system. Dr. Chambers is a professor in the Department of Family and Social Medicine, associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health, professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and the director of the Division of Family and Social Medicine Research at Albert Einstein's College of Medicine. His areas of research explore the intersection of social epidemiology and social medicine, how social determinants of health within the context of the physical environment can influence health behaviors and health outcomes in patients and populations. His professional interests and active research projects include affordable housing and health outcomes and residential mobility and health care use. The focus of Dr. Chambers' talk today is on housing as a social determinant of health. And his interdisciplinary research uh, aligns very, very closely with the work of our institute. Uh, we'll have time for your questions at the end of the talk. Please use the chat function in Zoom to ask them, and please direct your questions to the host. Um, and if you send them to the host, uh, they'll be forwarded to me, and I'll be able to ask them to uh, Dr. Chambers at the end of his talk. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So without further ado, let's welcome Earl Chambers to our grand rounds. Uh, thanks, Earl. Right. Thanks for the intro, um, Nevin. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to maybe set the context. I, I as you, you know, as Dr. Cohen mentioned, I'm the director of um, the Division of Research in Family and Social Medicine. And I'm an epidemiologist by training. So I'm a population scientist, but I, I, um, I'm the director of research in a clinical department. So the intersection of, um, of public health and primary care is kind of where I live. And the work that I'm going to to describe to you today is kind of how I got to this place of thinking through and understanding um, housing as a social determinant of health. Um, and so uh, I'll start just kind of by giving a little bit of context um, about my own life and experience, and then hopefully that will help um, sort of help give you an understanding of what's driving the work that I'm doing. Right? So in, um, in the late 1980s, my paternal grandmother came to live with us for a little while. She was born and raised in Jamaica and lived most of her adult life managing her type 2 diabetes. Uh, it was the first time that I was introduced to diabetes and what it meant to those living with the condition. Uh, my grandmother, um, uh, my grandfather actually also had diabetes and I would never get to meet him. Uh, he passed away from complications due to his diabetes before I was born. Um, he was in his mid 60s when he died. Um, but as most immigrant families often do, our grandmother lived with us for a little while. And when then she stayed with another of her children that settled in Canada. She ultimately got her Canadian citizenship and chose Canada 
um, in part because of their healthcare system um, that was more advantageous to her managing her chronic health condition. Nevertheless, while she was with us, um, I was able to watch how her diabetes consumed much of her life. Um, she had to make conscious decisions about what she ate, her exercise, her stress. It was day-to-day -day management, um, but she did relatively well and lived a long life. Uh, she passed away when she was 99 years old, and although by the time she died, she was almost completely blind um, and often complained of tingling in her feet and legs, um, you know, she ultimately lived long enough to meet her great-grandchildren, so that's a remarkable feat in and of itself. Um, I'm reflecting on my grandmother now, not just because of this presentation, but because uh, her birthday is in mid-April, and so reminders of her pop into my mind around this time of year. Uh, I'm thinking more about the overall cost of diabetes, not just to her and what it costs my family, but to the communities that we live in. And that cost is very high. So examining the ways in which social and neighborhood context matters for preventing and managing diabetes is an important consideration for me and the research that I do. So I'm assuming that there's a mix of faculty and students here and maybe other folk that are just interested in the topic. So no matter who's in the audience, I'm hoping that there's something in the presentation for everyone. So I'll just jump right in. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, please let me know if you can see the slides. I think they should be coming up pretty well. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. So I like to start with this, uh, these set of slides from the CDC, which just shows the age-adjusted prevalence of diagnosed diabetes over the years. And you know, I show this not just because it's dramatic, but because it just gives us a sense of um, you know, the prevalence of diabetes and its distribution across the country. And over the years, how it's becoming more and more of a concern. Um, so you know, when you think about diabetes and the toll of diabetes, um, I think these maps do a good job of showing really the overall um, burden of this this health condition, a chronic condition for, for many Americans. And, you know, it's not just the US problem. Um, if you look across the world, you know, this graphic from the International Diabetes Federation uh, shows that diabetes is a problem for much of the world and it's increasing in many places with large increases uh, projected in, um, in Africa, in the continent of Africa and in the Middle East. Um, so it's definitely um, a large concern for, for, for many. Um, and in the US, you know, diabetes is costly. Um, you know, it's upwards of $327 billion, um, 32, 34 million people with uh, that have diabetes that know anyway. So one in five don't even know they have diabetes. Um, but there are things that we can do, you know. Um, there is evidence to suggest that weight loss is an important component to being able to not just manage diabetes, but also preventing it. And we see sort of disparities of vibration and ethnicity with respect to diabetes, like we do with many other chronic conditions. So I'm gonna talk first about this project that um, I've been working on to look at type two diabetes prevention. So the National Diabetes um, Prevention Program is a CDC effort to provide resources to support um, a weight loss intervention program. And the evidence for this is from a trial back in the mid 1990s that showed that a lifestyle intervention that included weight loss was more effective at reducing the progression to diabetes than a um, than the group on metformin or on a placebo. So with evidence from this, the National Diabetes Prevention Program has been tailored and has been sort of um, used as a model for weight loss prevention, weight loss um, and diabetes prevention across the country. Um, but it has struggled to reach low income communities and communities of color. Um, fewer than 25% of the NDPP participants identify as black or Hispanic, even though the risk of diabetes related um, mortality in these racial ethnic groups is high. And men are underrepresented in DPP programs, comprising less than 20% of all participants. Um, however, once engaged, men do as well um, or better than women in achieving weight loss. 
And so what we have done in our hospital system, um, we had a, di a DPP program and we looked at the participants in our program and showed similar results to what we see across the country, which is um, the groups are largely um, made up of um, women, um, men are underrepresented as well. Um, and we sought to try to do something about that. So we published a number of uh, papers looking at this issue and looking at the relationship between um, DPP, whether it's in, um, whether it's referrals to community-based resources for DPP like the YMCA or our in-house hospital-based um, DPP program. And we wrote a grant uh, in back in 2019 to tailor the diabetes prevention program for men. So we received funding to, to conduct a, the, the one year weight loss program. And we provided the, we provided the, uh, the DPP to uh, patients through primary care clinics in collaboration with Montefiore Health System and with the New York City Department of Health. Um, and once the program was approved by the national DPP, we made available for, um, for other communities of color interested in engaging more men. So we call our program Power Up. It's a randomized trial, still under, uh, we're still working on it right now, so it's not finished yet. We're recruiting 300 men, um, 150 will be in the men only group, and then 150 will be in the uh, mixed gender um, standard DPP group. So the hope is that we'll be able to see if we can engage more men um, to participate in DPP and hopefully be able to provide this resource, um, not just to our patient population, but to the population that we serve. Um, but, you know, as many of you probably know, weight loss can be difficult. Um, and it's not because of lack of trying. Um, this table, this graph shows just the percentage of adults um, who have ever tried to lose weight. And, you know, it's relatively high, um, but it can be a challenge. And this particular graph also shows that despite our efforts to address these issues around um, individual weight loss, we still have an increasing problem when it comes to obesity and severe obesity. So it's continuing to rise and we need to sort of figure out different ways to address it. So this brings me to sort of this socioecologic model, which many of you maybe have already seen. But here the idea is that within this model, there, is, there are individual health behaviors that could be useful in preventing diabetes, but they're nested within these sort of spheres, spheres of influence, right? So individuals are, um, are nested with inside of families, inside of different schools or um, organizations, inside of communities, and then at the very sort of high circle of sort of public policy. And these all influence an uh, individual's ability to be able to prioritize the health behaviors that are important for their health, and in this case, diabetes. So the question becomes, how do we think about all of these layers and find ways to really think through interventions that could be useful in us being able to address these kind of what they call downstream determinants of health by looking upstream at different social determinants of health. So the social determinants of health as the World Health Organization defines it are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and a wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. Um, these forces and systems include economic policies and systems, developmental agendas, social norms, social policies, policies, and political systems. And, you know, in thinking about it, and I show the socioecologic model, you know, it seems somewhat straightforward, but, you know, I see this, um, I see this graphic and it reminds me that sometimes it's, it's, you know, quite complicated the way that all of these different um, aspects of people's lives sort of influence their ability to prioritize health reasons. Uh, health behavior. So, you know, in my mind, it, it kind of feels more like, like this, um, this info that I have here. But understanding the social determinants of health, um, there's, I'm not going to play this video now, but the Urban, um, Urban Institute, in collaboration with Dr. Um, Kamara Phyllis Jones, explains the good cliff of health. And this short video, I think, does a great job of explaining um, the idea of uh, the social terms of health and why they're important to understand and how we can start um, addressing some of them. So if you have a chance, this is a great video to sort of look at. So with that being said, I think the importance of housing shouldn't be a, a surprise. You know, when I think about sort of the men in our intervention um, and trying to get them to lose weight and, you know, weight loss sort of having a combination of their dietary choices, their physical activity and managing their overall stress, um, housing becomes a, a critical sort of component in this because 
where you live anchors you in communities and your access to resources. So your home becomes a place where um, you're able to connect to physical health and well-being, social connections, um, access to services, mental health and well-being. So whatever influences your ability to stay housed, stay permanently housed, and the access to the resources in those areas becomes important to you being able to prioritize you know, dietary choices and physical activity, and as well as managing your overall stress. And many sort of health-related organizations have, um, have spent some time sort of thinking about how housing is important to health. Um, this is one from the American Heart Association uh, looking at the importance of housing and cardiovascular health and well-being. And this scientific statement um, sort of explains or at least um, brings together a lot of the evidence and looking at how cardiovascular health is, uh, is influenced by, by housing, um, the stability of the housing, the quality and safety of the housing, the affordability and accessibility of it, and the neighborhood environment that it's in. Um, this particular question and answer that I did with the Urban Institute um, makes the case, at least to some degree, about housing as a social determinant of health. And I put it here just because it's, um, it's, it's another good resource for those of you who are interested in how housing matters. Um, this particular research at the Urban Institute around housing information, housing research is a great way to stay informed about what's going on and what's happening in that. In addition, um, you know, housing has been shown to be an important social term of health and research in, in this area has looked at its relationship to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, physical activity, anxiety, depression, unhealthy eating, sleep hygiene, hospitalizations. Um, this blog post that the, uh, the NIH has done around the role of community environment and many diabetes risk is another place where you can go to find some information about this if you're interested. So we published a, a number of papers just looking at this issue around housing and health. Um, but like most things, you know, the way you define housing is important to the risk. So housing can be described and characterized in a number of different ways. Uh, the type of the housing, whether it's an apartment style, um, semi-detached, multi-unit housing, the quality of that housing, whether there are maintenance violations, mold, broken elevators, crime, those kinds of things. The security, affordability, which includes things like the rental burden, um, public housing, eviction, overcrowding, and then the neighborhood that they reside within, which gets to issues around food availability, walkability, crime, noise, pollution, even gentrification. So housing can be compl complicated and there's many aspects of it. Um, and I tend to think of housing security on this continuum where on the one hand you have people who are unhoused um, and that is sort of at one end of the spectrum, um, unsheltered homeless and sheltered homeless. And then all the way through to secure housing where you don't have any worries about your housing costs and it's a good physical state of the home. But in between there where many people reside are in this space where you're in places that are either of poor quality or you have difficulty paying cost of housing because of the rental burden is high. Um, issues around overcrowding and how we define overcrowding is important too. And then, of, then the threats of eviction, which we, um, which we saw with the, um, with the housing crisis that, that we um, experienced um, a few years ago. So, um, and while I'm not gonna talk a lot about homelessness and that sort of extreme of housing insecurity, um, you can see from these numbers over time that the homeless issue is really um, one that we need to really address. Um, I think Dr. Cohen had mentioned just poverty is an important driver of health um, and homelessness, you know, stemming from this um, is also important for us to get a handle on. Um, this, is a, this is a problem that we need to sort of try and figure out. Um, so this is just kind of a, a study that, that we did to kind of look at housing density. In this case, it's housing density and obesity. And housing density is sort of a measure of crowding. And it really gets at whether you have more people than bedrooms in your home, that's sort of a common metric. Um, and we show that um, the risk of obesity was highest in these high households of black women, um, where black women had the highest risk of, uh, of obesity um, as it relates to um, a high household uh, density. And you know, another aspect of, uh, of household composition is what we call doubled up, which is living with multiple adults in the home. And so we tried to do with this particular cohort, and this is a cohort looking at the um, Hispanic Community Health Study on um, the study of Latinos, which is a 
longitudinal cohort um, funded through by NIH that is following um, 16,000 um, Hispanic um, residents over time um, in the US. And so we looked at the household composition and, and, and its risk to diabetes related preventive self-management behaviors or preventive services in hospital use. And this sort of figure here kind of shows the, um, the distribution of doubling up um, compared to not doubled up households. And then the risk of diabetes self-management behaviors, um, which include things like checking your feet or glucose levels, um, in addition to having the doctor check your urine or having your pupils dilated and uh, checking your A1C. Um, but the most, uh, the most important finding, I think, with this was looking at the relationship between doubling up and ED visits. So in this group, when we adjusted for a number of different covariates, we showed that there was an increased risk of, um, of having an ED visit among households where um, individuals were doubled up with other related family. So of course, we don't really know a lot about what these relationships are like or what it really means. What we do know is that there is something associated with how people are living and how they're doubled up in these homes that may be important to understanding their overall ability to manage their health. Another study using the same cohort that we looked at was foreclosure risk. In this particular study, we looked at the risk of foreclosure by census tract level. And then we looked at, um, at different sort of cardiometabolic um, risk factors um, among the people in, these, in the Hispanic community health study. And what we showed is that the risk of, um, of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia was, um, was highest in these areas where the uh, risk of foreclosure was high. For those of you who don't know much about the Hispanic Community Health Study, um, like I mentioned before, it's a large longitudinal cohort of um, Hispanic adults in the United States. And it recruits individuals from these four different cities. The Bronx is one of the sites, Miami, Chicago, and San Diego are others. So you have a, if you have an interest in this population, um, then if you go to this website, you can learn more about that study. And I think there are opportunities there to ask a lot of important questions um, around um, Hispanic health. Um, we publish a number of studies, some of which are using the Hispanic Community Health Survey, but others are, are around just the ideas of housing and housing and health and different types and ways of characterizing housing and different health outcomes. And this sort of, you know, it, it adds to the, to the body of knowledge around how communities and how different aspects and resources of communities are helpful to uh, prioritizing health behaviors, like I mentioned. Um, this infographic from the Active Living Research, I like because it kind of um, pulls together a lot of the evidence and, and gives it to you in sort of a, um, a very easy to digest sort of format. And, you know, looks at people who live near trails are 50% more likely to meet physical activity guidelines. Um, people who live in walkable neighborhoods are two times as likely to get enough physical activity than those who don't. Um, and just really sort of, um, you know, pulling together a lot of research around um, how the environment can be important to influencing health and health behaviors. Um, as a sort of a very extreme example of this, I think is, you know, up in the sort of the top panels here are considered more walkable, meaning that they have designated pedestrian areas, there's um, green landscape and there's um, green, um, a lot of greenery and greenscape. And on the bottom is kind of less attractive, less walkable environments that are um, not well-maintained with a lot of, um, of, of unwalkable and unpassable areas. Similarly with the food environment, which can get very complicated, but here we're just showing, you know, how having access to and access is not just about proximity, but also just affordability um, to the food environment can be helpful in being able to prioritize healthy eating as well. Whereas in the top panels are sort of um, having options for more healthy, op more healthy options and on the bottom sort of more unhealthy options. Again, another infographic, infographic showing changing communities that get people moving. And in this one, this infographic summarizes some of the evidence showing that when, um, when different changes to communities are made, um, there's the potential to increase the options for, um, for recreational physical activity. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here and just kind of share with you um, some research that we did in our hospital system. And this is sort of in our, um, in our primary care clinics or family medicine clinics, I should say, where we 
we're attempting to see if we could measure um, health behaviors somewhat systematically um, in among patients that were coming into our clinic for care. So the goal was to sort of pull together a number of different interventions that were happening at the same time. So we had our diabetes prevention program, we had our point of care community web pages, fruit and vegetable prescriptions, community health screenings, um, the Shop Healthy um, Bronx, which was in collaboration with the Department of Health and Play Streets and Zumba trainings. And then seeing if we could link the community health um, survey that the city does um, with the EHR data that we collect. And so we wanted to incorporate some of the same items and questions into our EHR and get that system um, up and running so that when patients come in, we can ask them some specific questions about their diet and activity. So this was kind of our first attempt to really see if we could one inf um, we could include these kinds of items into our EHR and how we could show our patient population in comparison to the population where they were receiving care. And these different, these next set of slides are just kind of showing what we saw. Um, so with, with respect to our different health centers, we have three different health centers, we were able to show kind of the relationship between our, the same item, the same questions in our patient population compared to the, the, where, the, where the clinic was located. So we showed here that um, for the Family Health Center, for our West Farms, for our Williamsbridge um, locations, um, this has walked or biked more than 10 blocks in the past. And it seemed like our patients um, were less likely to walk um, 10 blocks in the past 30 days than the, the neighborhoods where they received care. And we see similar relationships with physical activity and exercise in the past, and then having no servings of fruits or vegetables eaten yesterday, and one or more sugary drinks consumed on average per day. And so what this was showing us was that this may be an opportunity for us to really intervene. If we are measuring these kinds of health behaviors, then maybe there's a way to connect people to resources. So another part of this um, that came some years later was integrating the social determinants of health um, into our um, into our screening process in our outpatient clinics initially. And so this is some work by another colleague of mine who, um, Kevin Fiore, who's been working really, um, really hard to sort of systemize a way that we're able to measure social needs within our clinical population. And it's part of a overall effort to not just measure social needs, but then to, um, to refer patients to the kind of resources that they need um, and provide them opportunities to get some resolution to those social needs that they're that they um that they're describing to us. So it's a 10 item screener that asks questions around food insecurity, housing security, um, lack of transportation for healthcare needs. Um, there's a quality issue around housing and a security issue around housing, um, and needs for childcare, et cetera. There's a number of different different items there. And what we're able to show, um, and this is somewhat old data now, but this is on 140,000 unique patients. And this kind of gives you the distribution of different health needs. So the ones that pop up to the top, as you can imagine, is sort of the housing quality and the food tend to be the highest items, um, at least the prevalence of them is highest. And 18% of, um, of our patient population have one or more unmet social needs. Um, and about half of them report only one issue. So we've looked at these different social needs in relationship to different health outcomes. In this one, in this particular analysis, we looked at um, social needs among um, our patients that have diabetes and their ability to sort of um, be well-managed with the diabetes, looking at A1C levels. So in this case, we showed um, that the, um, the more needs a person has, the more social needs a person reports, is the more likely they are to have uncontrolled uh, diabetes. Um, and the social need that was most related to uncontrolled diabetes was on um, healthcare transportation. Um, food insecurity came next and then housing issues was third. Um, and this is, this is somewhat consistent with other research that we've done. And this is a paper again by Dr. Fiore who has looked at unmet social needs and no-show visits in primary care. And he showed that with increasing needs, there's an increasing likelihood of patients not showing up for visits. For visits. Um, and health travel ended up being a, a, a high predictor of no-shows. Um, and you can see here where all the other needs sort of fall in line um, underneath that healthcare travel, health travel relationship. So this particular 
uh, map is showing patients that are seen within our Monty Health System. Um, and we want to overlap that with different public housing units and be able to get a sense of the patients that we, um, that we see that live in public housing, um, what is their, um, what are their health conditions that, and, and is there a way for us to sort of better target our more high risk populations? Um, and this is just a few of the health outcomes that we, that we looked at, um, looking at obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, and again, just giving us a sense of where there may be opportunities for us to intervene. Um, as this may come as not a big surprise, but, um, but those of our patients that live in public housing tend to have a higher, um, higher prevalence of, of obesity, um, hypertension, and, and not, 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 not pre-diabetes surprisingly, but um, you know, we're still looking at different ways that we can intervene with our pre-diabetes population. And the National Diabetes Prevention Program is one of those. Um, this is a more recent analysis that we've done um, looking at patients that are struggling to afford food, um, patients with diabetes that are struggling to afford food and control their A1C. And in this particular analysis, we were looking at um, food insecurity. So patients that indicated to, to us during the screening that they had, a, um, they had a food security issue, they were having trouble affording food. Um, and then we wanted to look at that in relationship to the areas where they live and whether or not those neighborhoods or areas also had high levels of food insecurity. So we used sort of a USDA measure of food security to measure that. And these sort of purple um, places here just show where both of those are high, where there's, there's a, a high number of patients that are reporting food insecurity, and there's a high amount of um, food insecurity in those areas where they live. Um, and then sort of the, the grayish area where both of those are low, and then the pink and the blue are kind of the in-between. So In this analysis, we were able to show that patients with a food need um, are more likely to have issues controlling their diabetes. Um, and that's independent of whether they live in an area where there is a lot of food need or not. Um, and so that's sort of an important finding for us and sort of giving us a sense of, um, of where some of the interventions in our hospital system may be targeted towards individuals but there is information here that can help with the areas they live in and maybe there's food needs there as well. So, so I, I, I show this socio-ecologic model again, just to give us a sense of where we're landing. So at this individual level, we're showing that, you know, prioritizing, um, you know, healthy diets and physical activity and stress management is important but so are the areas where people live in and the conditions they live in that help them be able to prioritize that. So looking at these interpersonal relationships, organizational and community settings are also important. But as we keep going upstream, we also wanna look at public policy and the policies that are able to influence um, where people live and what they have access to in the places where they live. So this aligns in a lot of ways with um, the social determinants of health from healthy people and their priority goals I mean, healthy people sort of sets the nation's priorities for health. And in this case, we're looking at social determinants of health and neighborhood and built environment is one of these key components. Um, and if you look at sort of their, their priority areas, um, I'm just sort of getting you to focus here on reducing the portion, um, the proportion of uh, families that spend more than 30% of their income on housing. So acknowledging that rental burden is a problem or um, the housing cost burden is a problem it, means that the higher that cost is, the less there are resources available for everything else. Um, that reducing the amount that people and families spend on their, um, on their housing is an important way for us to be able to allow them the opportunity to prioritize healthy behaviors. And when we look at the Bronx, and or even just all of New York, um, we can see where those, the rental burden is highest. And this tends to be in the areas where there's also, um, overall sort of higher cost of different chronic conditions and health care and health um, and health conditions. So, and in the Bronx, what we know is that high poverty, um, poor housing conditions increases the risk of homelessness and insecure housing. So being able to manage that rental cost is important. And data suggests that's true. I mean, the moving to opportunities demonstration, which is probably the largest um, of the sort of trials and I guess it's a, it's a randomized, um, as randomized as you can get 
um, experiment to look at um, three groups of individuals that are going to be using um, a Section 8 um, housing um, mobility voucher to be able to move to different kinds of neighborhoods. And the groups that they, they had a group that were able to use Section 8 um, in low poverty areas and a group were able to use Section 8 um, wherever they they, they were they wanted. And then another group that were in place and they were um, control group that had um, project-based assistance. And so what they were able to show in this particular study was that um, people who were able to move using the housing vouchers to low poverty areas, um, they saw a reduction in their extreme obesity, um, A1C, um, and, in, and then depression over, over the course of the study. So um, there's some evidence here to suggest that um, being able to move to areas and places where there is um, there's low poverty has an opportunity for people to be able to be healthier in a number of different ways. Um, there are a number of different issues with the study, but if you're interested in it, um, that's something that I recommend um, you know reading about. Um, we decided to try and see if we can look at this relationship in a population of um, residents living in the Bronx, and we looked at public housing versus Section Eight um, versus people on no federal assistance. Um, and we were able to show a similar relationship to what they found at MTO. Of course, this is all cross-sectional, but um, we looked at different health outcomes, get diabetes, um, risk for heart attack, stroke, hypertension, and depression, um, where public housing um, had the highest risk and Section 8 had a lower, had a lower risk. Um, again, much of these uh, data are published and you can look those up. Um, so, as we round out and kind of look at this um, in its total sort of context, um, you know, it, there are different layers to thinking about how policy may influence community organizations into personal individual levels um, and how these um, are ways in which people may have difficulties sort of prioritizing health behaviors. But when it comes to housing, um, it's important to also recognize that almost at every stage of housing, um, there's racism and discrimination. And whether it's redlining, urban renewal, rental options, mortgage lending, exclusionary zoning, public housing, restrictive covenants, racial residential segregation. I mean, there are a number of different ways in which, um, which individuals are either um, relegated to certain areas where the options for um, the health options are fewer um, and we need to sort of address them all. I think one of the most um, most known, I think, is redlining. And this is just a redlining map if you haven't seen one before. This is the Bronx, and it shows where, um, where, the, um, where the, red, the red areas are places where they were considered to be high-risk loans, and, so, and then green areas are considered to be like low-risk. And this, is, was, this was used to determine, um, for banks to determine where loans will be given. Um, and as you can see, like mostly these areas here, red line areas are areas where, um, where black residents and residents of color were relegated. And if we look at this map, which shows just the overall kind of highest diabetes related mortality rates, you can see that the areas that were lighting up when you looked at the redlining areas kind of overlap with these areas in the Bronx that are like also high risk. So this is a podcast that I recommend anyone who's interested in looking at housing and health um, and just gives you some history about, um, about different neighborhoods in the United States and how it, they change over time. So this was called There Goes a Neighborhood. Um, it's a WNYC kind of studio production and it's great. So if you have a chance to listen to that or if you do that kind of thing with podcasts, then this is a great one. Um, but I also wanna talk a little bit about a more recent interest of mine um, and it has to do with the, the issue of the impact of climate change on health. Um, and you know, all of what we're doing, and we, we've seen this with, um, with the increasing number of, uh, of super storms and extreme heat and its risk in, um, in affecting the health of our population. And I think it really has the potential to, uh, to really exacerbate um, Health related disparities that already exist. And so, you know, I've been interested and more recently in looking at extreme heat events and um, wrote this perspective piece. Oh, let me go back. Um, looking at extreme heat 
and um, kidney disease in historically marginalized communities. So, you know, in this particular sort of perspective, I, I make the case, uh, me along with other colleagues make the case that the increasingly hot sort of um, extreme heat environment has really the potential without any sort of adaptation or mitigation to really cause a increase in mortality and overall morbidity among our populations that are already vulnerable. Um, I'm gonna skip this just for time. Um, this pop publication I think is worth reading. It's how decades of racist housing policy left neighborhoods sweltering. And in this analysis, um, uh, both Plummer and uh, Popovich, they examine redlined areas and they look at um, extreme heat events sort of in those areas, but they also look at the different sort of characteristics of those particular environments that are um, that exacerbate heat and they make they make they make these neighborhoods hotter. So they look at things like canopy cover, tree canopy cover. They looked at different things like um, you know the amount of concrete and porous environments that they have. Different things that really are related to whether or not um, neighborhoods are going to be hotter or not. And in that, they showed that the neighborhoods that are redlined have uh, more risk of not having these kinds of heat mitigating features in them and end up being hotter on average than environments that do have them. So that was, that's an interesting read. Um, let me skip this. So if you wanna think more about health equity, um, which many of us are interested in now, you know, I use again, the World Health Organization's definition here. And that equity is the absence of unfair, avoidable or remediable differences among groups of people whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by other dimensions of inequality. For example, sex, gender, ethnicity, disability, or sexual orientation. Health is a fundamental human right. Health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential for health and well-being. And I think what's happening is a number of different health organizations are thinking more about equity framing and equity frameworks. Um, this is from the American Diabetes Association and their Health Equity Bill of Rights. And it shows in, in just this statement around health equity um, that people deserve a right to access to insulin and other drugs and affordability, the right to healthy food, the right to insurance that covers diabetes management and future course. And it really, uh, you can go through all of them, but it really sort of centers um, you know, what we think is important to overall health equity, especially around diabetes. And, and it's really a call to advocacy and a call to action for us to be able to really, um, you know, be more active in, you know, advocating for, for rights around these issues. And I wanna highlight some work of some medical students that we have here at Einstein who've been sort of really taking this on. Um, they wrote this opinion piece looking at um, why physicians and public health leaders should support the capping of the cross Bronx Expressway. Now, there's been a lot of, work around this and the potential for capping the cross Bronx, which, you know, is a, a heavy polluter in the Bronx. And it has, you know, really captured the attention of a number of different community organizations and policymakers um, in the Bronx. And it's, you know, they're, they're looking at ways in which you can actually cap the cross Bronx and parts of the cross Bronx that go under grade and, you know, make not just a filtering of some of the, um, the emissions from the trucks that go through and the cars that go through the cross Bronx Expressway, but also providing uh, on top of these cappings, you know, the opportunities for additional green space that can connect parks that were um, historically sort of like destroyed as part of urban renewal and and really this the um, the way that the expressways in the United States have been sort of developed over time and going through these different communities, particularly communities of color, as we um, expanded across the United States with these different. Um, different roadways. So the students have been really working hard on this. Um, they have a publication that they put together on how the Bronx um, is building and transforming the Cross Bronx Expressway and other green infrastructure projects. Uh, this is their website, so you can go there. They have a podcast that kind of talks to a number of different leaders in this field. And um, I think it's a great way for them to, um, to work in advocacy around, um, around these sort of different policies and, you know, there was recently sort of a, a sort of town hall that described, um, we tried to get um, input from the community about reimagining the Cross Bronx and ways in which 
this capping project may or may may work. So um, that was very exciting to see. Okay, I want to maybe end with a couple of projects that I'm working on more recently. Um, there is a redevelopment campaign in around Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, and um, we have a recent study to look at um, our patient population that live in these redevelopment areas and following them over time to look and see um, how the different changes in neighborhood could potentially affect their cardiovascular health. So we're going to be following groups of patients in uh, the Jerome Avenue redevelopment area and in Southern Boulevard, another group in Southern Boulevard that is not undergoing this redevelopment and be able to sort of look at these different health outcomes over time. So that's a pretty exciting project that's just getting underway. These are the areas here. Um, and there are sort of a map showing their proximity to one another. Um, I also wanna leave with a, a resource. So um, we at Einstein have a Center for Diabetes Translation Research. It has, it's part of a network of um, different CDTRs across the country funded through NIH and their, um, and their Institute of Diabetes um, or NIDDK. And they offer, we offer uh, pilot and feasibility grants. Um, so for anyone who's interested, uh, faculty who are interested in pursuing research around, um, around diabetes and it's in the translational sort of space. So, you know, we have cores that address issues around behavioral science technology um, life course methodology. I lead the population health and health systems core, along with colleagues from, um, from NYU. We have partners in, um, from Mount Sinai and um, CUNY as well. Um, our Latino network for diabetes translation research is also there. Um, so if interested, um, please, I mean, anyone can apply. So um, you're able to get um, upwards of $50,000 for one year um, to be able to, to help with maybe pilot study or pilot work that you might be doing trying to address issues around, around diabetes. Okay, so I'll end with my contact information. If anyone is interested and want to reach out, get a hold of me, I'm easy to find, email is the best way. So I will leave it there so there'll be time for questions and I can try to get to them. Uh, thank you so much, Earl. Uh, this is really uh, terrific and your work uh, as always is uh, fascinating and uh, in inspiring and uh, I hope uh, present some opportunities for faculty collaboration and also student um, collaboration with your your lab. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions that are in the chat, but I want to uh, uh, remind uh, folks who are on, on the Zoom that uh, you have an opportunity now to jot down questions if you have them or comments uh, to host, and uh, I'll direct them to Dr. Chambers. So we have one question from, from Sarah uh, Brunig, and I may paraphrase it a bit, but she, she's asking whether the uh, effects that you talked about earlier in, in the talk, the cardiovascular effects, come from the actual residences or from the neighborhoods? And so how do you disentangle the effects that occur from uh, specific apartments, their conditions, the cost of apartments versus the characteristics of the neighborhoods that people live in? Yeah, very, very difficult to do. I mean, um, a lot of ways it's trying to first be able to capture or collect data at both of those levels. Um, in some ways, we're, we're not really able to disentangle it quite so well. Um, so I don't have a great answer to that other than to say that, you know, at the end of, at the, end of the day, you know, what we try to do, at least in part, is um, identify the kinds of um, uh, upstream sort of levers that we think are the most important to these downstream effects. So if you're thinking about things like um, like reducing um, rental burden, you know, policies that address rental burden um, and lowering the amount of the overall household income that they'll pay on their rent um, has the opportunity to affect sort of these downstream kinds of um, uh, health and health behaviors. Of course, you know, disentangling that from their access to resources or whether or not they can afford those kinds of things. Again, it's difficult to do, but we, we the, at least the, the concept or the idea of it is that these upstream levers uh, that we think control people's ability to prioritize, at the end of the day, the priority of the health, of the health, in, of the health behavior has to be on the individual level, right? Our, whether we want to prioritize these kinds of things or not. And then once you get to that stage, then the question is, does, is your environment conducive to you doing that? Um, and so 
both of those have to kind of work together. Um, and so it's, but it, again, it's, it's hard to disentangle. So I don't have a great way to do it other than being able to at least control for what we can. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, Dean Iman, I'm uh, uh, honored that you're here. And, and um, uh, uh, Dean Iman Aldenhandis asks, um, how long can these effects last after an individual leaves the unfavorable environment? And could you comment on intergenerational effects? With respect okay, to so, yeah, so the first one is, um, so the evidence that we have that try to suggest that moving to a, a neighborhood with more resources is better, um, it, it, I guess it depends. So for some, the, the transition to, so for example, using the moving to opportunities as an example, because that was kind of using a housing voucher to move to low poverty areas. And the assumption there is that low poverty areas have more health resources, which they tend to. Um, but the question is how well can people move? So the effects tend to, tend to last for as long as the, the people stay in those neighborhoods for the most part. But, but again, and then, but, but the, but staying is an issue from moving to opportunities. So there is something about the social connectedness of neighborhoods that also matters. So again, it's, it's like not an easy, easy sort of answer. And we don't have a lot of evidence to show um, what happens when people move because these kind of experiments are difficult. To, it, it's, you can't randomize people to neighborhood. It's very difficult to do. So um, we have to kind of piggyback on existing policies that are trying to move people to different places. And that's, you know, we have kind of selective samples when it comes to that. But the best that we can do is just being able to kind of isolate, um, you know, the people who are able to stay and whether or not they're able to like have um, healthier outcomes as a result of it. And then it depends on which outcome we're talking about. For this, I think um, obesity tended to be one of the, one of the bigger ones. Um, so it's, it, but the others that not all the health outcomes were, were better when people moved. I also say that, you know, moving to opportunity is not a sustainable strategy for getting people to be able to be healthier. So we have to be able to sort of change environments that they're already in. So that becomes sort of part of the Jerome Avenue project is to try to see when these capital investments, these big investments happen, people who are already, who are staying in these places, are they able to benefit from those kinds of changes when they come on? There was another part of that, the... Uh, the inter intergenerational effects, how, how long do... I don't know the answer to that. That would be like, do the, do like, do the children of the people who move, are they able to benefit, you know, more from those? There is data on that from NTO, but I'm not as familiar with it. So there is some data to suggest that, that the children do better too, but I, I, I don't know that for sure. I have to check. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you mentioned the social networks and their importance. I, I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on the distinction between physical environmental changes, economic uh, changes, uh, reducing housing cost, and the environments that are more or less conducive to social networks, which can be really protective in, in lots of ways um, of population's health. Um, certainly in, the, in, in response to climate change impacts, uh, neighborhoods that have you know, dense social networks where people can take care of each other tend to do better in outcomes than, than the neighborhoods with fewer social ties. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there is some evidence to suggest that social cohesion is an important sort of um, uh, or resilient factor in neighborhoods. Um, again, that, that evidence is, is not consistent. So it's hard to say what are the aspects that are most important. What we do know, if we're talking about just climate change in general, or extreme heat, let's just use that example specifically, is that um, you know, people who are socially isolated tend to be more at risk, usually older folks, because they, they just don't have people just kind of help sort them out. In a lot of ways, um, you know, the perception of the risk is also important to them being able to get to, add it to, to these adaptive features. So whether it's you know, um, um, access to, to cooling stations or information around how to stay cool in, when, when, extreme, when there are extreme heat events is something that it's better to have a network of people to be able to help you sort that through. Um, but again, there's like, um, it's, it's difficult to tell like, what are, the, what are the main aspects of social networks and cohesion that's most important? So those things can be measured in a number of different ways. And so characterizing them becomes complicated, I think at times, but I think when we talk about trying to access resources and tapping into these social networks, 
is important for at least for dissemination of information. Great, thanks. We have a question from uh, Judy Gomez. Uh, how can healthcare providers, academic medical institutions, and researchers leverage this data? And you've presented a lot of a lot of diverse data, uh, and and influence uh, policy and policy change at city, state, and federal levels. And she says, think specifically now that um, COVID-19 federal and state level protections are being rolled back, but the inequities, the structural and institutional inequities that cause and exacerbate these health out outcomes haven't changed. So um, yeah, how, how can we leverage this, this data to, to change public policy? Okay, so I think you know the, the, the way that I tend to think about it is this, is that, um, for us in a, in a large hospital system, our ability to, to be able to collect data around social needs and social determinants of health is, uh, is an advantage to being able to better characterize populations, particularly at small geographic sort of scales. So um, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's a way to complement sort of um, larger data sets that are around the neighborhood level or more and more community-based kinds of um, population-based um, data. And then being able to show how the data can be used at, I think, multiple different levels. You mentioned sort of policy at the higher sort of federal policies, um, but there are state policies too. And then there are also policies that influence or at least um, advocacy around particular neighborhoods and particular um, resources within those neighborhoods. So I think the data becomes important at multiple levels. Um, but I also say, and this is kind of what the students have been doing as an example, is that in the work that they're doing around um, uh, capping the cross Bronx. It's the issue around transportation has become a big issue for us in the hospital system because we're showing that it's a social need that's related to a lot of different health outcomes. And so leveraging those data to be able to say in our neighborhoods where these highways exist that have been influencing our sort of residents for years and they have been saying this for a long time, the biggest question is always, well, do you have data to show that that's true? And so that's one. And then if so, how are you able to leverage that data to be helpful to the residents that live there? So part of it is advocacy work. You have them, the students are using this to be able to show, hey, in this large hospital system, it's like the largest sort of healthcare provider in the Bronx. Um, our data is suggesting that this is important. Um, so you try to use those data to leverage it. The federal level becomes challenging, of course, um, but, but you know, starting sort of to, to gain sort of momentum, at least at this local level, we think is important to be able to change um, the perception of how these different interventions can be useful. And then not in addition, just being us as a hospital system being able to be more responsive to the needs of our patients, because before now we're not, we, we hadn't been asking this in any systematic way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Rosita Ilieva, um, uh, to what extent does the relationship between housing conditions and diabetes vary by age groups and how do housing conditions influence diabetes risk among older adults compared to younger populations. We've been working with uh, city meals to try to figure out the, the wider needs that we expect exist in New York City for home delivered meals and grocery deliveries. Um, but do you have data on diabetes varying by, by age and specifically among older adults compared to younger? Yeah, so for, that's a good question. Um, we, didn't, we didn't do that. So. But I can see that there, you know, there, there are a different set of needs, at least for for uh, across sort of this adult. I guess for us, the average, I guess the average age of of, of diabetes is like forty five or so, and so for most of our our patients with diabetes are are in that age range or older. Um, mm -hmm. But whether there's there are differences between our older adults, I'm I'm I'm, I'm assuming maybe we're talking about um, sort of our you know post retirement age 65 those kind of older groups I, I, I'm not sure so that, that's something that we could we could we could do though mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah, groups with, with mobility limitations in, in particular um, would be yeah yeah uh, Glenn, Glenn Johnson uh, asks uh, well, he comments uh, capping the the cross Bronx and converting the newly created surfaces to green space sounds like a tremendous improvement to public health and livability in the Bronx especially if those green spaces are used to connect to existing parks. Um, but the challenge, and this is a question I had as well, is to prevent resulting gentrification that ultimately displaces current residents uh, who these improvements are meant to benefit in the first place. 
And I think this is a, a, a larger question about the redevelopment in the, in, in the Jerome uh, Carter area, for example, and other redevelopments. Um, how do you begin to measure the balance between the positive effects on housing and neighborhoods and the potential negative effect, effects of displacement? And yeah. even, even not, not just physical displacement of residents, but displacement in terms of changing amenities and, and, and access to supermarkets and other facilities in the neighborhood? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and this is a, this is sort of a constant kind of like um, back and forth and trying to figure out the best way to do this. And so I'll, I'll say this, I'll say that, um, that these communities ask for these kinds of changes all the time. So it's not, so that's, that's the first. And then the, then the question then becomes when these changes are coming, can they be the first to benefit? And then that's the, another sort of point of, of priority. And so, and when you go to sort of these community meetings around these redevelopment efforts, that's always top of mind, which is we do want these changes, but we wanna be able to stay here and enjoy them and be able to have access to them. And that is to some degree, a little bit different than the question of people who have been here for a long time, when the resources do change, are they for them? So is it something that I connect to? Is it something that I'm familiar with? Does it sort of, I mean, those are different. Those are, are, are also important questions. And so neighborhoods change all the time. So the question is, is you know, in what ways can we um, prevent sort of these issues around displacement? And the study that we're doing around Jerome Avenue is really looking at older adults. So we're looking at 55 people, 55 and plus, the older sort of spectrum, because they tend to be more stably housed than younger people just in general. And then also being able to look at, you know, well, how do they perceive these changes over time? So we don't always know the answer to this. So um, are you able to access these resources when they come on? Are you able to, in, to like to, to benefit from these kinds of changes? Um, and in what ways? And so, you know, part of this study that we're doing is it's a mixed method. So we're looking at this qualitatively as well. Um, and then being able to, to be able to say something about exactly what you're asking, like how do we address those issues? Um, and, you know, I think the, the issue of displacement is something that doesn't have to occur. So the, 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 the question that becomes like, how do we, you know, it's like, it's, it gets into these questions about how do you, how do you deal with like a housing market that just gets out of control, which it always is in New York. Um, and I don't have all the answers to those. It's sort of, it's sort of a thing where doing nothing is not a good option, you know, because they, they still need this kind of development. I mean, the, 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 the neighborhood should be safer, they should be more walkable, the park should be accessible, they should be able to have resources that are important for younger people and older people to, to enjoy green space. Um, all that still needs to happen. Um, but when you open and you redevelop and you rezone, then, you know, housing housers come in and sort of they kind of do what they do and, and being able to regulate that becomes complicated. So um, that's outside of my space of expertise around sort of how the housing market does what it does. <laughs> and I'll, I'll complicate this further by asking Mohammed Salim's question, which is, um, could you comment on the responsibilities of corporations and the change in prevalence of diabetes, especially in terms of targeting poor communities with unhealthy foods? And I would add unhealthy marketing of, of, of foods. How can we prevent the harm corporations are inflicting on our communities? I guess I would put that in the context of um, what, what, what role uh, do corporations play in influencing the behaviors that you're working to ensure the physical environment and food environment can, can actually protect people from? Yeah, so so this is yeah. So I don't, I won't begin to to be able to comment on all of the forces that actively. I mean, I think I think we a lot of times maybe pretend that these food environments are passive, and they're not, right? They're they're actively trying to promote unhealthy options as well, and they're people whose job it is to try to figure out how to target people for these kind of things. So, and it's I mean, I think it's 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 the kind of work that um, you know New York has been trying to address with things like, I mean, when it comes to like things like smoking or things like um, these soda taxes and different kinds of like um, placing um, calories on menus, like those kinds of, of uh, attempts to make um, these industries more accountable when it comes to these kinds of things. But, you know, and there's been some evidence suggests that they work to a certain degree, um, but, you know, 
again, like uh, being, a, I don't, I don't have the answer to how we, how do we hold them accountable? How do we say you're, you shouldn't be able to do this? Or, um, you know, I think some of what the Department of Health has been doing around, I think they had like a healthy bodega initiative was around this, trying to trying to make healthier options more prominent in these kinds of stores and um, and and their ability to, their ability to really influence um, influence that becomes like very difficult and, and and a lot of times you know you may not have any any real sort of leverage with being able to force um, these industries to sort of take this on other than you know and this is sort of my personal opinion is some sort of shaming but that tends to not always always work well so I, I don't have a good answer to that I mean that's I think we kind of do what we can do in the spaces that we control um, and, but I acknowledge that, you know, in a lot, and research sort of suggests this to some degree is that, you know, the food environment is a very complicated one. I mean, it's one where, you know, it may not just be about like healthy options, it's about the competition for the unhealthy options and the unhealthy calories too. So that, 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 that poses a whole new challenge to being able to get people to prioritize healthy options. But, you know, it's clear like what we're doing around, um, you know, sort of diet and weight loss by suggesting that it's just about a person's individual willpower to be able to prioritize stuff. It's just not, it just doesn't seem to be true. Um, you know, we need to sort of really make these kinds of decisions possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a, a question. And by the way, we have uh, time for a couple more questions if, if uh, people in the audience want to uh, post some right now. But a question was about your graph showing the difference in outcomes from NYCHA residents compared to Section 8 residents. Um, NYCHA was a, a social innovation at the early part of the last century and a progressive era effort. Um, and in, you know, in, in many ways provides really um, you know, sound housing for, for many, many people. Um, what do you attribute the difference to, do you think, and are there ways that you've been sort of looking at NYCHA as a as a specific typology of housing and it, its effect on 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 this very large population, it's five hundred thousand New Yorkers yeah. who live in NYCHA housing? Yeah. Um, so I think the way that we've been thinking about just um, targeting, or I should target not the right word, but but. Um, Maybe focusing more on our patients that are in public housing is because of just the higher risk that's associated, higher health risks that are associated with living in that in those kinds of environments. And so for us, the, the question was, um, you know, because it's such a large amount of people that live there, are there ways that we can identify, you know, where there is increased risk in our patient population in ways that we weren't able to do before? The resources are always limited. So being able to prioritize those at highest risk are, are sort of what the, where the priority lies a lot of times. So, and should housing be one of those things? So if you think about like our social needs really addresses things like if an individual mentions that they have issue with their housing. So uh, being able to afford it or the quality of it. So those are things that may, may require different interventions. And in our ability to be able to help them intervene on those may change depending on what they're saying. If it's something like mold, um, then you know our clinicians can, can do something about that, writing letters, addressing issues around just abatement, those kind of things. Um, whether it's a ability to afford it, it depends. I mean, if it could be like a high, if it's a high priority kind of um, population that are at risk for homelessness, as opposed to it just being kind of an unstable, a currently unstable housing situation, then there, there are different interventions for those things and our ability to intervene kind of varies. So, um, so I, I think of it more as a, as a, like, where do we focus our limited resources kind of question, um, as opposed to, you know, um, you know, whether or not, like, we, we should do something about NYCHA or not. I mean, that, that, that is, that's a separate, that, that's a, that's a related issue, I do believe, but, um, you know, but, but you're right, it does provide, you know, I guess, more stable housing than, than not being housed, for sure. So. Um, but, but at the same time, there are issues with it that also need to be addressed. So for us, it's just kind of thinking about ways that we're not characterizing our patient population before that we should, um, and being able to, to think about how resources can be, can be leveraged to, to help those that we think are most, the most in need. Mm -hmm. So Erla, this is Ayman and Mohandas. They finally allowed me to use my voice. I, I just wanted to say 
Thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that this is an entree for us to work together in the future. Also, there are many things of interest, but first and foremost, Camera is a sister to me. So Camera Jones is, is, a, is a very dear sister to me and yeah. we worked together at APHA for many, many years. And she was one of our uh, commencement speakers at some point in our life. But oh, yeah. at any rate, I'm, I'm very excited that you chose to visit with us today. And I hope that this is an entree for a long-term collaboration. And uh, there are many, many things that we can think of. Uh, it's, not, it's not all in your neighborhood over there. We have our, our problems here in Harlem as well. Sure. Uh, but you know, sometimes uh, these issues related to housing and the environment, sometimes they're overt as you described, and sometimes they are covert yeah. as you also described. So we would like, we would like perhaps to think of cohort studies over time because you're still very young. I'm an older man, but you are a young man and you have many years ahead of you like Nevin. And so I think cohort studies have a value. We, we learned a great deal from some cohort studies in India that looked at, uh, at intergenerational effects based on the health of mothers during pregnancy uh, impact of diet on pregnancy. Uh, these people who left India a generation ago and then came to the United States and they live in Chicago and we, we discovered things about them and their health that is intergenerational. And we know for a fact that stress has an intergenerational effect. Yeah. Even though you are a fetus in the womb of your mother, and experience stress in that manner that leaves you with health effects for the rest of your life. So my, my, uh, my wish, my dream for you is to be able to create a cohort study like this that you can follow for a long, long time. We have uh, Christian Grove in our school who has been following uh, the cohort of gay men uh, now for a, a decade or more. And, and that in itself, shows effects that are long lasting. Uh, and uh, it is important also to say that remedial effects, be it staying put in the same place with improvements or moving to another area may not resolve the health effects completely. And that's what my question was saying that unfortunately we need to take that very seriously because even with remedial effects, the health effects last. Uh, obesity is not easy to reverse. Yeah. The metabolic syndrome uh, is a lifetime effect. Stress and its effect on the cardiovascular system, on the immune system, and on mental health is uh, long lasting. And so we would love very much for you to partner with us and, and we can think of ways where we can perhaps start some studies that can follow some of these communities over time and perhaps educate people in the future about the seriousness of much of what you described. Thank you for allowing me uh, to use my own voice, Nevin. You're very kind. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Ivan. And um, I wanna thank you, uh, Earl, for presenting um, a, a really wonderful overview of your work and uh, Echoing Ayman, I do hope that we find uh, more ways to collaborate. We've already been collaborating, I'm in uh, on some projects, but we, we really want to uh, work with you more closely uh, over the next several years. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I tried to give as broad a perspective as I could, because I know that it will touch on a lot of different things that people in this group will be interested in. And so, and like you said, Nevin, we, we collaborate um, already. And, you know, through our Diabetes Center, we, we also collaborate with CUNY in that way. We have faculty who are part of that. And that's just different ways that we can, um, we can connect. Um, that's, we're always open to that. So, yeah, any opportunity for, um, for faculty or students or, you know, to, to be a part of any of what I'm, what we have, I didn't show everything we're doing, but there are, I give you the, the branches so you can see kind of what all of the scope of things are and, and we're always open to, to collaboration, so. Hopefully we, hopefully Nevin will invite you to lunch and, and we can also tell you about what we're doing on our side. Great pleasure. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Today. Appreciate it. Thank you again. Bye. Take care. So with that, I'd like to end uh, the, the, the um, grand rounds and uh, I hope that you'll uh, attend our next 
uh, Grand Rounds next month and stay tuned um, for announcements of, of future uh, uh, presentations, both from the School of Public Health and also the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.